In my structural engineering made simple series, today I'll continue the discussion on composite beam system design. This is part two of a two part series and focuses on using superposition of elastic stresses with effect of shoring in design. Please take a moment and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this page before we continue. This video is part two of a two-part series on composite beam systems. It explains the procedure for finding the moment resistance of a composite section for which the method based on plastic distribution of stresses cannot be used. This will be the situation with composite section for which the steel structural member has a slender web where h over tw is larger than 3.76 square root of e over fi. h over tw is a measure of the slenderness of the web of the cross section, as you can see in here. E is the modulus of elasticity of a steel member, and fi is the yield strength of steel. Please note that when a standard section, such as W sections, are used, H over TW is smaller than 3.76 square root of E over FI. And as such, the method based on plastic distribution of stresses can be used to design the beam or compute the moment resistance of an existing system. The method based on plastic distribution of stresses is covered in my Structural Engineering Made Simple series, Lesson 22. In situations when H over TW exceeds 3.76 square root of E over FI, AIAC has a more conservative process and the computation of the bending resistance MN is done based on the superposition of elastic stresses with considerations for shoring for the limited state of yielding. A typical situation when this happens is when a steel structure members with a very slender web, such as in some plate girders are used. This video specifically explains how MN can be computed based on the superposition of elastic stresses. In practice, usually, the geometry and dimensions of the steel structure member and a slab are known. Therefore, a practical design approach is by computing phi BMN and making sure MU is smaller than phi BMN. Phi B is a resistance reduction factor, which is equal to 0 0.9 for calculations. Therefore, at times the design may need to be completed through trial and error. Also note that a major design parameter is sigma qn. So what is sigma qn? Sigma qn is a strength of shear connectors between the point of maximum positive moment to the point of zero moment on either side. Therefore, for a simply supported beam, this is over one half of the span length of the beam. Please note, the following reference is used in the preparation of this video. AIAC 2005, Steel Construction Manual, 13th edition, published by the American Institute of Steel Construction. If shear connectors are not used, the system is not a composite beam. In that case, the steel beam is designed without the contribution of a strength from the concrete slab. The slab design and its reinforcement is not covered in this video. The slab design follows the procedures of the American Concrete Institute, ACI. Please watch my Structural Engineering Made Simple series, Lesson 9, design of reinforced concrete one-way slab that would be applicable in this case. If the construction of the composite beam system is done without shoring support, then the adequacy of design of the system will need to be verified for two stages of loading. A. During construction. 
In this case, the steel beam alone must be able to carry the dead load of the slab and its self-weight and without the slab contribution. Also, the deflection of the beam will need to be checked to make sure it is limited to no more than 2.5 inches for proper placing of concrete. B. After the system is completed and concrete has reached its required strength, the system acts as a composite structure with the steel and concrete work together, carrying all the loads, including dead load and live load. The live load deflection after the construction and with the composite beam action in place is limited to L over 360 when L is the span length of the beam. Design procedure. In this video, the design procedure based on the LRFD method using the provisions of the American Institute of Steel Construction Manual is explained. Since generally the composite beam systems in buildings are designed for floor loads, the following two load combinations are considered in computing the factored applied moment MU and factored shear load VU. 1.4 times the dead load, 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. For roofs, if the snow load is more critical than the live load, the load combination will be for the dead load and the snow load with considerations for the potential snow drift on the roof. The distribution of the snow load with the drift on roofs is usually a triangular or a trapezoidal distribution. General configuration. This figure illustrates the general configuration of a composite section and its dimensions. Please notice that B prime is specified as the effective width of the exterior beam. B is defined as the effective width of the interior beam. Also notice that the dimension SE is given, which is the distance between the exterior beam and the end portion of the slab the spacing between the adjacent beams is either S prime or S, that usually these two are identical. B prime is minimum of SE plus S prime over two and SE plus one eighth of the span length of the beam, while B is a minimum of S over two plus S prime over two and a quarter of the length of the beam. Also, notice that another dimension is given here is HR. This is for situation when metal decking is used. HR is the height of the rib in metal decking and it's at least equal to three inches. And also notice that the thickness of the slab is designated as T along with the other dimensions of the steel structure, such as width of the flange, thickness of the web and thickness of the flange and so on. Transform section. So what is a transform section? The procedure in computing the bending resistance requires computation of elastic stresses using the section properties based on a section that is called transform section. To make a transform section, reduce the concrete area by a factor n equal to Es over Ec, when Es is a modulus of elasticity of a steel and ES is modulus of elasticity of concrete. In reducing the area, only reduce the width and not the thickness. Form the transform section as shown in this figure and find the location of the centroid, which is designated by Y bar, and compute the moment of inertia for the entire section. In a sense, this is a built-up section made up of a block of steel at the top. We have put an equal amount of steel for concrete with dimensions as T for the height or thickness and B over N for the width. Please watch lesson 20 of my Structural Engineering Made Simple series 
for the procedure on finding the centroid location and moment of inertia of a built-up section. That would be applicable to this case. Let's look at an example. This example is from lesson 22 of my Structural Engineering Made Simple series. In that lesson, there is a mistake in the calculation of parameter n, which caused the numbers be off. Here is the correct solution. For concrete, we use modulus of elasticity equal to 3605 KSI. Therefore, the correct value for n should be 8. And in that video, erroneously, a value of 9 is used. So this is a transformed section. The effective width is reduced to 11.25 by deducting 90 by 8. The beam size is a W16 by 26. HR is equal to 3, and the thickness of the slab is equal to 4. From the AIAC manual, we'll find the properties of a W16 by 26 has a moment of inertia with respect to its own axis, which is at a distance d over 2 from the bottom flange. And if I can show this d over 2, you realize where the centroid of this section is located. And we are using the bottom flange, the lowest portion of the bottom flange, as our reference lines for the computations. For the compression block, the moment of inertia is obtained based on the rectangular cross section, and its area is equal to 45. And also, the location of the centroid for that block can very easily be computed with respect to our reference line. Now, once we know the area, the moment of inertia, and the location of these pieces, we can find the sum of the area moments with respect to the reference line and divide it by the total area. That would give us the location of the centroid, which in this case is 18.8. And then we can find the moment of inertia for the entire section accordingly. And in this case is 1,444 inches to the fourth. Now let's look at another example. We want to form the transform section for the composite section shown in here with B is equal to 72. Concrete is three and a half inches thick and uses a prime sub C equal to four KSI. However, in this case, the steel system is not a W section or a standard section. It is made of plates. And then the bottom flange is a plate 12 by 3 quarters of an inch. So is a top flange. And the web is a plate 22 and a half by 3 sixteenths of an inch. As you can see, the thickness of the web is uh, pretty small. So this is a, a very a slender web. The depth of the entire steel section is 24. And again, Y bar represents the location of the centroid for this uh, section. With a normal weight concrete and a strength of prime sub C equal to 4 KSI, the specific weight is about 150 pounds per cubic foot. And we use the ACI recommended equation for the modulus of elasticity of concrete. That's WC to the power of 1.5 multiplied by a square root of prime sub C. When WC is the weight of concrete per cubic foot and a prime sub C is in KSI, final result is in KSI, 3674. And then we find our parameter N, which is 7.89. It is customary to round up the number to the nearest a, the nearest whole number or nearest half number. Therefore, the values for n usually are 7.5, 8, 8, and 5, etc. So here now is our uh, transform section with the block of concrete is reduced, have a width of only 9 inches. And uh, we can very easily find the location of the centroid by knowing exactly what the properties are. And because uh, 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 this section is made of rectangular sections, we can simply find the properties uh, 
based on the value of the moment of inertia of a rectangular section, which is bh cubed divided by 12. So uh, we need to find the areas for individual pieces. The area of the steel is obtained as 22.2. And we know that the centroid of the steel is at 12 inches from our reference line. And the moment of inertia for the steel is made of uh, uh, two parts, uh, the moment of inertia of the flanges and the moment of inertia of the web. So that's 2610.5. For the compression block, we have the area as 31.5 square inch. And we have his own moment of inertia as 32.2. And we know that the location of the centroid of the compression piece with respect to our reference line is equal to 28.75 from the geometry and location of the centroid of the steel is at 12 inches. So uh, by finding the moment areas with respect to this reference line and dividing by the total area, we compute the location of the centroid for the entire section. So here are the calculations. Uh, static moment or area moment of the steel, area moment of concrete, divided by the total area of the cross section that gives us 21.8 that's the location of the centroid and for the moment of inertia uh, this part is from steel is the moment of inertia of the steel section with respect to its own axis plus the area of the steel multiplied by the square of a distance between the axis of the steel section and the axis of the entire section the location of a centroid of the entire section. A similar term is done for the concrete block, which is now reduced, of course, is a compression block. And we call this one ITR, representing that this is the moment of inertia for the transform section, and it's 6,296.3. We also need to find another parameter, and that's section modulus. We do it with respect to the bottom flange of the steel, and that is ITR divided by Y bar is 288.8. The reason we do it based on the bottom flange of steel is because the criteria for computing MN is based on the very first yielding of tension steel. And finally, uh, we also write down the section modulus for the steel section itself because it is needed for our calculations later when we compute the moment resistance of this section. And S sub S, as we refer it to, the uh, um, section modulus of the steel section is 217.5. Computing the moment resistance. As explained before, we utilize the superposition of elastic stresses in finding MN. Two situations are considered. The system is unsured or the system is short. For the unsured system, AIC specifies that in this case, the stresses on the steel section from permanent loads applied are superimposed on the stresses on the composite section from loads applied to the beams after the hardening of concrete. So my interpretation of permanent loads means dead loads, primarily and especially during construction. For short system, all loads are assumed to be resisted by the composite section. Before we continue further uh, explanation of how MN is computed, uh, let's talk about two additional parameters. One is called the equivalent moment of inertia, IEQ. The other one, the effective section modulus, SEFF. Depending on the resistance of the shear connectors, sigma QN, the composite section behavior will be affected. In considering this effect, the AIC manual suggests using an equivalent moment of inertia and an effective section modulus. The equations are very similar. This is the equation for the 
the equivalent moment of inertia is is the moment of inertia of steel plus the square root of sigma q n divided by a factor cf multiplied by itr minus is there is a similar equation for the section modulus I will talk about the CF later, but uh, first realize that IS and S are the moment of inertia and section modulus of the steel section. ITR and STR are the moment of inertia and section modulus of a transformed section. Considering the uncracked concrete and fully composite action, the section modulus refers to tension flange of the steel section as we discussed before. The parameter CF is a minimum of the ASFI and 0.85 prime sub CBT. This is a tension on a steel, and this is a compression on concrete. So we find this model of the two value, and that's a CF. AIC also has additional recommendations for continuous beams that are subject to both negative and positive moments. So please read the AIAC if you are interested in handling continuous beams. The AIAC recommends design for the ratio of sigma qn over cf larger than 0 0.25 to maintain the adequate stiffness for the composite section. Also note that sigma qn is equal to the minimum of these two values and it cannot exceed these values. Therefore, sigma qn is equal to cf, cannot exceed cf. Based on these two limits, we can write this inequality that sigma qn is bounded by cf and 25% of cf. This will provide us with some guidance on selecting values for sigma qn for our design. Of course, if we have information on the number and type of shear connectors, we can compute sigma qn accordingly, knowing the strength of one connector, which is qn. This is shown later, but first let's explain how qn is computed. The resistance of one connector when headed bars are used is obtained from the following equation. Notice that there are two terms in Qn. One depends on the strength of concrete. The other depends on the strength of the headed bar that is used as a connector. ASC is a cross-sectional area of the connector in square inches. F prime sub C is a compressive strength of concrete. EC is a modulus of elasticity of concrete. We talked about it before. It depends on the weight of concrete WC. FU is the minimum tensile strength of the shear connector in KSI. In KSI. And if A108 shear studs are used, FU is about 60 KSI. Sometimes we refer to connectors as shear studs. Also, please refer to AIC for the equation for QN when pieces of channels are used for shear connectors instead of bars. That's another alternative for shear connectors. As you notice, two parameters, RG and RP, appear in the QN equation. They depend on the system configurations and whether metal decking is used and in what direction the decking runs compared with the steel beam. If no metal decking is used, RG is equal to RP is equal to 1. If metal decking is parallel to the steel beam, RG is equal to 1, RP is equal to 0 0.75, as long as WR over HR is larger than 1.5. WR is the width of the rib of the decking, and HR is the height of the rib. However, if WR over HR is smaller than 1.5, RG now is equal to 0.85. Now, RP stays the same as 0.75. If decking is perpendicular to the steel beam, which is usually the case, because it will provide lateral support for the steel beam during construction, RG is equal to 1, RP is equal to 0 0.6, if only one start in the same decking rib is used. 
similar to this case. RG is 0 0.85, RP is 0 0.6, if two stars are in the same decking rib. And finally, RG is equal to 0 0.7, RP is equal to 0 0.6, if three or more stars are in the same decking rib. Some of these values may be increased for special conditions as explained in the AIAC manual. Therefore, in determining sigma qn, two situations are possible. One, select sigma qn based on the inequality we discussed. Then select the connector size, determine qn and the number of connectors n using this equation n is equal to sigma qn divided by qn two if the type and number of connectors are known determine qn and if n is n identical studs are used between the point of maximum positive moment and zero moment then sigma qn is equal to n multiplied by qn however we must make sure that Sigma QN is bounded by the two limits as we discussed before. Computing MN. For onshore system, the superimposed elastic stresses on the steel section for permanent loads and all loads after concrete is hardened. And we compute the action uh, when, the act com when the composite action is taking place. Uh, F1 is a stress on a steel section for permanent loads. So if I interpret again the permanent load means dead load that MU divided by SS, SS is section modulus of steel. F2 is a stress on a steel section for all loads and that's MU divided by SEFF. You notice that for all loads after composite action is taking place, we use the effective section modulus. In limited state, MU is equal to phi BMN. So if I substitute for MU in the equation and then add the two stresses, I'll come up with this equation. And in the limit, this equation is equal to phi B multiplied by FI. FI is the resistance of the steel section, the yield strength of the steel section. Now I can solve this equation for Mn and I come up with this equation for Mn. And of course, if I need the factor resistance, that would be 5b multiplied by Mn with 5b equal to 0 0.9. So this is the way that I interpreted the requirement for onshore system and came up with this equation. I welcome comments by viewers who may know a different way of computing Mn. Please write your comments and let us know what you think. And if you have a new equation or different equation, please share it with us. For sure, the structures, the stress after a concrete hardens and composite a section has formed is computed and needs to comply with the yield strength. So in this case, we only have the F2 stress, which is MU divided by SEFF, and in the limit we set it equal to 5B FY, and that would give us the following equation, of course knowing that MU is equal to 5B MN, and put it in, in here, we come up with MN equal to SEFF multiplied by FY. And for factor resistance, again, we multiply phi B by MN. As seen in these equations, two factors contribute mainly to the bending resistance. One is the strength of shear connectors, which would affect SEFF. The second one is shoring, which helps with the utilization of the full yield strength. Let's look at an example. The system shown in example two is now used in a floor system. The beam span is 45 feet. The live load is 125 pounds per square foot. Metal decking is used, which is perpendicular to the steel beam. 
The spacing between beams is 6 feet. In addition to the weight of the slab and the beam, there is also a superimposed dead load of 25 pounds per square foot. This includes the weight of the metal decking as well. So I'm showing the configuration again. Let me uh, look at it earlier in example two. You want to compute the factor resistance phi BMN for two situations, onshore system short system so first we need to find mn of course and then we multiply by 5b shear connectors are used in pairs each is a headed bar with 0.5 inches in diameter as shown a total of 40 pairs are used over each one half of the span of the beam so here we have the shear connectors and the metal decking and the steel beam so you can see the configuration Load analysis, for the dead load, a weight of concrete is 150 times the thickness of the concrete divided by 12, so we'd have it in feet. So we get the final result, 44 pounds per square foot. The additional 25 pounds per square foot is added, so we get the total dead load of 69 pounds per square foot. However, to that, we have to add the weight of the seal beam. Uh, for that, we have the area of the steel beam. I multiply by 12 inches, so we have the volume over one foot. And then I multiply by 0 0.28, which is the density of steel. That is uh, 0 0.28 pounds per cubic inch. So that gives me 75 pounds per linear foot. Now we can combine the two loads. I multiply the 69 that I found by the tributary width, add to it the weight of this steel beam and I get 489 pounds per linear foot. And for the live load, 125 times the spacing between the beams, the tributary width, I get 750. Okay, now for the applied bending moment for the dead load, I use 1.4 as a load factor and using the equation for the maximum bending moment of a simply supported beam, I end up with 173.3 foot kips. For the total load, I use 1.2 for the dead load, 1.6 times the live load, and I get 452.3 foot kips. Now for the bending resistance, first we need to decide on QN. Because here we know how many studs we have, and if FU is equal to 60 for A108 studs, because there are two studs per rib and the decking goes perpendicular to the beam, QN is equal to 6.1 kips, and there are 40 pairs, so total are 80 studs over one half of length of the beam, so I get 488 kips. And let's compute CF which is a minimum of the two values we talked about. And that gives me 799.2. And you can see that sigma QN is smaller than CF. So we are within the range. And also if I find the ratio sigma QN over CF, and that's 0 0.61, which is larger than 0 0.25 that AIC suggests. So we are fine on this sigma QN. It doesn't give us the full composite action, it gives partial composite action. The full composite action would be obtained if we had a QN exactly equal to CF. Sigma QN exactly equal to CF. All right, so we need to modify the moment of inertia using equivalent moment of inertia according to equation that I gave you before. And that turns out to be 5,489.2. And the same, we find the effective section modulus, which is going to be 273.2. Now, uh, earlier I gave you this equation for Mn, so we plug numbers in there, knowing that the phi b is equal to 0 0.9, so just plug a number in there. And the final answer for Mn is 577.7 foot kips, 
and if I multiply by the resistance reduction factor, I get 5mn of 520 foot kips. Well, naturally, this is larger than the applied total bending moment, so our design is okay for the onshore system. Here, I like you to pay attention to uh, the moment during the construction for dead load divided by the section modulus of steel. That gives us 9.6 KSI of applied stress. We have to make sure that this stress is less than the resistance of the steel beam by itself, is less than the resisting capacity of the steel. However, this is a plate girder, and for that you have to do a separate analysis to find out what would be the allowable stress or the ultimate stress that uh, in LRFD can be used. The discussion on plate girders is of course not covered in this video, so take a look at AIAC. There is a complete discussion on plate girders. Plate girders, because they are made of plates, they require the stiffeners at the ends, so you can get uh, the shear controlled and also they need uh, lateral support. So, of course, during construction, uh, when we are not using any shoring, as long as the decking is perpendicular to the beam, that will provide lateral support. So at least in that sense, it would help in that sense. Anyway, to continuing with the problem, we need to find the deflection during construction. And for that one, I'll use only the dead load and also using the modulus of elasticity of the steel section itself. I come up with 0.6 and many designers suggest that this has to be less than 2.5 inches for proper placing of concrete. So we are okay in this front. Now let's look at the short situation. I gave you an equation MN as SEFF multiplied by FI. So uh, we plug numbers in there and come up with the MN equal to 820.8, the factored capacity is 738.7, so naturally it's okay, it's much larger than what we need, and that was expected for the short system, we come up with a larger value. As a last step, we need to find the live load deflection after the composite action has taken place, and please notice that for this one, I use I equivalent. And I use the live load in here. The answer is 0 0.33 inches, and this has to be less than the span length divided by 360, which is 1.5. So we are okay, and our design is fine. As explained in this video, in situations when h over tw exceeds 3.76 square root of v over fi. The bending resistance phi mn is obtained based on superposition of elastic stresses. It is advantageous to use a short system for the maximum bending resistance of the composite section. Also note that in this video, we did not cover the design for shear. For that, the shear resistance of the steel section alone without the contribution from concrete is used. Thank you for watching this video.